Welcome to the third day of uh, this week. Um, we continue with the last mini course by Professor Ransford from Laval University on Dirichlet spaces. Um, Thank you, Gerard. Um, so this is a continuation of the two previous lectures. In the first lecture, uh, let me recall that we defined the Dirichlet space and um, described boundary behavior of functions in the Dirichlet space in terms of capacity. And yesterday we discussed zero sets of functions in the Dirichlet space and multipliers. And uh, today I want to discuss uh, three more aspects of uh, the space, namely conformal invariance, uh, weighted Dirichlet spaces, and to finish with invariant shift invariance subspaces. <clears throat> So as always, uh, feel free to, to butt in if you have questions or uh, ask a question in the chat. I'll try and keep an, an eye open on the chat. Uh, but we have plenty to get on with, so let's get started. Uh, so um, first remark here is a very simple one. It's a formula for the Dirichlet integral of the composition of two functions, f and phi, where phi maps unit disk into the complex plane, and f is the final image of phi. And this is nothing other than the usual change of variable formula for using the Jacobian. So there's nothing very uh, deep in this. Um, I'll just use it to, to introduce the notation n phi of w. So this is the number of solutions of the equation, number solution z of the equation of phi of z equals w. Okay, so here are a couple of simple consequences of this formula. <clears throat> the first one is that if uh, phi is injective, and just by taking f of z to be z, uh, f dash will just be one, and n phi will be one, and so you just get the area of phi of d divided by pi. So this is a geometric interpretation of the, the Dirichlet integral of a, an injective function. And even if phi is not injective, you can still, uh, this equality still holds, but you have to count area according to multiplicities. And this way of looking at the Dirichlet integral is sometimes helpful. So uh, an interesting fun fact here is that if phi is in the Dirichlet space, then the area of its image must be finite. So certainly it can't be surjective. There are no surjective functions in the Dirichlet space. That's not true, for example, of the Hardy space. And another consequence of this formula is that if phi is an automorphism of the disk, so phi sends the disk back into itself, <coughs> um, then, well, n phi is one because phi is an automorphism, and you just get left with uh, the same integral, the Dirichlet integral of f. So the Dirichlet integral of f composed with phi equals the Dirichlet integral of f. So there's this. Merbius invariance property of the Dirichlet integral. And what's interesting is that this actually characterizes more or less the, the Dirichlet space. Uh, so one often hears this uh, result, but um, actually it's, it's not simply that the, the Dirichlet space is the only Merbius invariant holomorphic function Hilbert space. Uh, it's the fact that this, this norm or this integral remains invariant. So here's a more careful statement of this characterization. So uh, H will be a, a vector space of holomorphic functions on the disk. And uh, we'll suppose we're given a semi-inner product on H and curly E of F will just be the semi-inner product of S with itself. So at the back of our minds, we have the idea that H will be the Dirichlet space and E will represent the, the Dirichlet integral of F. Uh, okay, so we have the following theorem of RSV and Fisher. Uh, so suppose we have the following four properties. So the first property is really the key one. It says that if f is in H and phi is an automorphism of the disk, then f composed with phi again belongs to H, and the value of this uh, E functional is preserved. So that's really the, the key property. And then the others are things we have to add in to make the theorem true. The second one is a completeness statement. It says that um, essentially this E defines a Hilbert space norm on, on H. Uh, so that's it's complete. The third 
assumption says that convergence in this norm is somehow related to the real world. Uh, we want it to imply pointwise convergence on the disk. And the final assumption to avoid trivialities will assume that H contains at least one non-constant function. And then the conclusion is that H is indeed the Dirichlet space and E is a positive multiple of the Dirichlet integral. So I think that's a very nice result and it, it serves as an extra motivation if I'm needed for looking at this space. <clears throat> um, so this property of uh, Mobius invariance um, leads one rather naturally to considering composition operators. So if I'm given a, in fact, any holomorphic function from the, the disk into itself, I'll define C phi to be the, uh, the map that takes a function F, a homomorphic function F and composes it with phi. So this is a, a composition operator. And what I just said, if phi happens to be an automorphism of the disk, then C phi maps the Dirichlet space into itself. And it's a fairly natural question to ask for which other functions phi is this uh, true, is this statement true? Uh, in the case of the Hardy space, the answer is rather nice. It's true for all phi. This is a famous result called the uh, Littlewood subordination principle. In the case of the Dirichlet space, it's no longer true. And uh, you can see that this very simply, I mean, if, if C phi maps the Dirichlet space into itself, in particular, C phi of the function Z should be in the Dirichlet space. So phi itself should be in the Dirichlet space. And it's not all functions that self maps of the disk that belong to the Dirichlet space. Uh, here's a simple example, um, which I just cooked up. You can just check it directly or if you prefer to quote some results from earlier in the course, any inner function that's not a finite Blaschke product also will serve as an example of a holomorphic self map of the disk that's not in the Dirichlet space. So in that case, C phi certainly does not map the Dirichlet space to itself. And then the natural question is to ask which phi do have this property. And the answer is uh, contained in the theorem of McClure and Shapiro which is that the necessary and sufficient condition is that this multiplicity function n phi that we defined on the previous slide uh, with area um, has this property. So that on any Carlson box SI, the, the, if you think of this as a measure on the unit disk, the measure of, on the Carlson box should be bounded by a constant times the length of I squared. So this very much resembles the condition that we saw yesterday for Carlson measures of the Hardy space. And in fact, it's exactly the condition to be a Carlson measure of the Bergman space. Rather well, strangely, it's the Bergman space that enters here, not the Dirichlet space. Um, so more than that, I'm, I'm not going to say, but this is the, the necessary and sufficient condition. And uh, as a nice consequence of this, uh, there are some easily checked necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, C phi to map D into itself. So here phi to the K is just the ordinary kth power of phi. It's not a composition, it's phi to the multiplied by itself K times. So these, these follow from the McClure Shapiro characterization. Uh, so there's a large industry of composition operators and all sorts of questions that you can ask about them. Uh, I'm going to sort of sidestep that. I'll mention a few further developments at the, the end of the section. I just want to, to mention one result that I, I can't resist. Uh, and this is related to weighted composition operators. So uh, a weighted composition operator is a composition operator followed by a multiplication operator. And we've just seen which composition operators are bounded on the Dirichlet space. We saw yesterday which multiplication operators are bounded on the Dirichlet space. Uh, there's a very complicated classification of characterization of multipliers. As uh, Jonathan Partington pointed out in his talk, uh, obviously if you have two such operators that are bounded, their product will be bounded, but it can happen that one or other of them is unbounded and yet the product remains bounded. So there are some delicate results about 
which weighted composition operators are bounded operators. But the theorem I want to mention here, it goes in a completely different direction. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, uh, concerns a, a linear map from the zero shift space. I don't assume that it maps the zero shift space back into itself. I don't even assume that it's continuous in any sense, just that it's a linear map defined on the zero shift space into the holomorphic functions. And then the following conditions are equivalent. So T maps nowhere vanishing functions to nowhere vanishing functions. So it preserves the set of nowhere vanishing functions. That's one condition. And the second condition is that T is a weighted composition operator in the sense that you can write it as psi times F composed with phi, where phi is a holomorphic self map of the disk. And psi is any holomorphic function on the disk that doesn't vanish. <clears throat> um, I mention this because uh, it actually uses some of the technology that uh, was developed in the, the talk yesterday. The, at the end of the talk, I mentioned some factorization theorems that are proved using ideas about uh, complete pick kernels. And this is uh, an essential ingredient in our, our proof. Um, incidentally, uh, I forgot to mention yesterday that uh, many of these ideas about complete pick kernels uh, are likely to uh, appear in, in more detail in one of the subsequent um, workshops in this focus program. There's a workshop, workshop on the Drury Arvison space, which is a, a version of the Hardy space in several complex variables. And that space plays a central role in this theory. So I just want to advertise that. And there's also a, another um, workshop a bit later on, I think, on non-commutative non function theory. And this also plays a role even in proving commutative uh, results, including one of the factorization theorems I mentioned yesterday. Um, oh, and one final thing, the J Rance that you see uh, who's in the theorem is uh, my son, Julian, who was a student of Javad at the time we proved this theorem. There's a question, are we assuming that the number of solutions are finite here, unlike an infinite rush to product? No, and n phi can be infinite. So just to finish the, the chapter, here are some further developments. Once you've um, characterized bounded composition operators, the next obvious step is to characterize compact ones. And this was also done by McClure and Shapiro. And as so often happens in this uh, context, the characterization is exactly the same, except you replace the big O by a little o in that theorem. Uh, you can also consider when these composition operators are in various Shatton P classes. And uh, there's a paper on this by Lefebvre, Lee, Kefilek, and Rodriguez Piazza. In fact, I think they've had several papers on, on this sort of subject. And another thing one might expect is that if, if phi is sufficiently, if C phi is sufficiently compact, then the image of the disk under phi should only touch the boundary of the disk on a rather small set. And um, this was investigated in detail in a paper of uh, Gallardo Gutierrez and Gonzalez. And there've been several other papers since then which have developed these results. Okay, let's move on. Um, any further questions on that chapter before I go? Seems not. So uh, we'll move on to weighted Dirichlet spaces. Um, so I'm going to discuss in two particular families of, of weights. Uh, the first family has already appeared in, in several talks. <clears throat> So we, oops, excuse me, we um, uh, include this, this uh, power weight here. It's part of the, the Dirichlet integral. I'll call that thing D alpha F. And um, well, we can define a, a space D alpha using this weighted version of the integral. And uh, here are some properties of this. So first you can, uh, again, uh, expand that as a Taylor series, plug it in <clears throat> and 
evaluate the integral with polar coordinates. And what you get is, just as with the classical Dirichlet integral, we got k sigma k mod a k squared. You'll now get something that looks like k to the one minus alpha. It's not an exact inequality, exact equality, but it's it's uh, the, the ratio of the two sides is about it above and below by fixed constants. Um, and so you'll notice here that we have a one minus alpha, whereas I had an alpha here. In many of the other talks where these weights were discussed. The defining property was, was this one. And if you start with that, it's, it's more natural to um, write alpha here instead of one minus alpha. And then the, the convention changes. So sometimes you should be, be, be warned that my alpha is sometimes other people's one minus alpha. In fact, even I'm not always consistent about this. But uh, I think starting from, from this definition, it's a little bit more um, logical to, to take alpha as the the parameter. So with that choice, the central value of alpha, alpha equals zero, gives you the just the Dirichlet space. And as has already been mentioned uh, several times, if you take alpha equals one, then you get something that's isomorphic to the Hardy space. Um, and so what happens for the other values of alpha? Well, in between these two, in between the, the Dirichlet space and the Hardy space, you get a uh, a chain, a family of, spa of spaces d alpha, which in many ways behave a bit like the, the classical Dirichlet space. They're more like the Dirichlet space than they are like the Hardy space. Um, and the, the, the natural potential theory that's associated to the d alpha space is the one where instead of using the logarithmic kernel, you use uh, the, the kernel one over distance to the power alpha, the Reese kernel. And this gives rise to uh, the Ries capacity C alpha. So many of the results that I've uh, talked about for the classical Dirichlet space have versions for, for D alpha as well. Um, on the other side, uh, so as alpha decreases, these spaces are getting smaller. And in fact, what you end up with is something that uh, all the, the functions uh, extend continuously to the boundary of the unit disk and they are Banach algebras. Uh, and so the, the flavor changes quite, uh, quite considerably. On the whole, these are, these are a bit, little bit easier to deal with than the, the D alphas of positive alpha. Um, okay, so another family of weights are uh, what you get by, instead of taking the, the power weight, sorry, I'm gonna go back, Instead of taking a, a power weight here, you take here a positive harmonic function. Um, we'll see why this is a natural thing to do in the, in the course of the lecture today. Uh, so a positive harmonic function can always be written as the Poisson integral of the positive measure on the unit circle, and, I'm up, and it's convenient to think of it this way. So I'll take as my starting point a positive measure on the circle, finite measure, and P mu will denote its Poisson integral. And this is a, a harmonic positive function of Z. And a general positive harmonic function can be written in this form for some suitable choice of mu. And then I'll define uh, the, the corresponding weight of Dirichlet space, D mu, with this weight. So it's a Dirichlet integral with this weight. So these spaces were first considered by Stefan Richter in a paper in 1991, and we'll, we'll see why uh, a little bit later on today. Um, and their properties were further developed in a, a joint paper with Richter with Carl Sundberg just a year or two afterwards. Um, so uh, some special cases that are, are worthy of note. If you take mu to be just normalized the vague measure on the circle, well, the Poisson integral of normalized Lebesgue measure is just the constant function one. So you end up with a one as your weight and you're back to the classical Dirichlet space. And another uh, interesting special case is when mu is just a point mass at a point zeta of the unit circle. Zeta here is a point of the unit circle. Uh, then you get uh, something which is called the, the local Dirichlet space of zeta. And uh, by slight abuse of notation, it's often denoted d sub zeta. 
And you can think of um, Seems that there is a connection problem again. Yeah, we'll just wait for a little bit. I'm sure he'll be back soon, yeah, sure. hopefully. Sorry. Um, just a second. Um, uh, um, excuse me a moment. I just have to open the right file. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure at what point I'm cut out. I think you were just starting to talk about the local deer flea spaces. Okay, so uh, we can recover d mu from d zeta just by uh, integrating with respect to mu. This is just Fubini's theorem. If you look at the, the formula for the d mu integral here, p mu is itself an integral, and just by swapping the two integrals around, you get this formula. So you calculate d mu, um, it's enough to be able to calculate d zeta, and we'll see a, a neat way of doing that in just a second. So here are some properties of these d mu spaces that were developed by Richter and Sandberg. So first of all, they all uh, are contained in the, the Hardy space, and they become a Hilbert space if you uh, define, for example, the norm this way. There is an analog of the Douglas formula that we, we saw in the first lecture. So the, the Douglas formula was a formula for the Dirichlet integral expressed in terms of the, the boundary values of f on the unit circle. And so this is the same formula, except we've replaced one of the Lebesgue measures by d mu. And um, a particular case of interest is when mu is just the Dirac mass at zeta, and then this integral just becomes one integral for a, fi for a fixed zeta, it's just the inside integral that remains. And this gives a, a, a quick way of calculating uh, d zeta f. In fact, f belongs to d zeta, you can see it from this formula, if and only if f is of the form a constant plus z minus zeta g, where g is in the Hardy space. And the d zeta integral of f is nothing other than the, the square of the Hardy space norm of g. So you can compute d zeta of f quite easily from this, in, at least in many cases, and then d mu of f just by integrating up with respect to mu. And this is the kind of general strategy that uh, often works. So for example, one uh, result you can get this way is a, a Carlson formula for d mu f. So Carlson's formula for d of f was a, 
an exact expression for the, the Dirichlet integral of f, um, where expressed in terms of the outer factor of f, the, the zeros of f, and the singular inner measure of the singular inner function. And there's an analog for, for d mu. Uh, so Richter and Sandberg also proved this by first of all doing it for d zeta and then integrating that with respect to mu. And their, their proof is quite different from that of uh, Carlson. And in my humble opinion, it's much uh, easier to follow. So if uh, Carlson's Formula is a special case of this because it's just a special case where mu is, is a vague measure. Um, another fact about these spaces is that uh, it's interesting is that polynomials are dense. So this is not quite so obvious as it would be for the, the classical Dirichlet space. In the classical Dirichlet space, it's sort of obvious from the formula for the, the Dirichlet integral in terms of Taylor series that you can just take a function in the Dirichlet space and truncate its Taylor series, and that gives you a, a sequence of polynomials that will converge to f in, in the norm. That doesn't work in, in d mu. It's not true in general. The, the polynomials you get that way won't converge to f necessarily, and you need some other method. Originally, this was done by uh, Stefan Richter using a, an operator theory technique, and then in the richter sundberg paper, they reproved it by uh, exploiting this inequality. So uh, here, fr is the the radial dilation of f, fr of z equals f of rz. And uh, they prove that d mu of uh, the radial dilation remains bounded independently of r by four times the um, d mu of f. You, you, you would think that it was sort of obvious, but it's, it's not so obvious. And uh, actually, it, it, we had to wait a few years until uh, there was a proof where you could replace four by one. And the proof was uh, a rather interesting technique of Don Saracen, where he identified the, the d zeta spaces with rather particular de branche rovniak spaces. And in these very special de branche rovniak spaces, um, the, uh, the, the norm of FR was less than the norm of F. That was his method, another indirect method. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to advertise another um, workshop in the focus program, which is devoted to these very interesting spaces, the demand for the next spaces. Okay, so here are some further uh, developments of these ideas. Uh, so these DMU spaces, uh, they also have capacities associated to them. Um, you can, uh, one, one thing where, the, where they are more difficult is the they are certainly reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, but we don't have an explicit expression for the reproducing kernel. This is something that's a bit special to the, the classical Dirichlet space, but there are now uh, estimates, at least for the diagonal of the reproducing kernel and applications to the capacitors. So this is a, a paper of uh, El Fala and Madani and Kelly. Um, so I've talked about the demu spaces as being spaces with harmonic weights. Uh, a little bit after the richter sundberg paper, Alleman introduced the uh, notion of superharmonic weights, so positive superharmonic functions. And uh, it turns out that a lot of what's true for harmonic weights also goes over to the superharmonic weights. And it's rather nice because it actually gathers in one family, both the, the harmonic weights and the power weights we saw at the, the beginning of the chapter. Uh, so this is really a very, very beautiful theory. And let me mention finally that uh, these DMU spaces have also have the complete pick property. This is a rather remarkable uh, theorem of Shimarin, who proved that the I mean, I, I said the space has a complete prick property. More correctly, I should say the, the kernel has the complete prick property, even though we don't have an explicit expression for the kernel. We can prove that it has this, this important property. And uh, this is true, actually, not just for the harmonic weights, but also for the superharmonic weights. And in fact, Shimarin's proof uses superharmonic weights in a rather essential way. Even if you're only interested in harmonic weights, you, you actually goes via the superharmonic weights to prove this. Okay, so uh, that completes what I have to say on, on weighted Dirichlet spaces. I don't know if there are any questions. Unfortunately, when my link went down, I also lost the, the chat, but I've, I've reopened the chat. So if there are any questions, I'll be 
happy to try and answer them. Okay, so um, let's move on. So the last uh, topic in this mini course is shift invariant subspaces. And um, well, just to uh, introduce a little bit of notation. So in general, T is a bounded operator on a Hilbert space H. I'll write lat TH to denote the, the lattice of all closed T invariant subspaces of H. I think this is fairly standard notation. And uh, I'll denote by MZ the shift operator, the operation of multiplication by Z. And the, the theorem that is kind of the model for, for everything that we, we do here is this uh, truly wonderful theorem of Berling that kind of lies at the center of so much of, of function space theory. So it says it gives it classifies the the closed shift invariant subspaces of the Hardy space. They're of the form, they're exactly the spaces of the form theta h2, where theta is an inner function. And uh, well, given Berling's theorem, it's kind of natural to ask what happens in the case of the Dirichlet space. What are the shift invariant subspaces of the of the Dirichlet space? Well. Um, it's helpful here to uh, examine the, the shift operator on the Dirichlet space and try and isolate some useful properties. So here are three properties that turn out to be key. But the first one is a kind of generalization of the notion of isometry. So on the Hardy space, the shift operator is an isometry. On the Dirichlet space, it's no longer an isometry because the uh, the expression in terms of the power series is not sigma mod a k squared, but sigma k mod a k squared. And because of the factors of k, when you, you shift, uh, you, you, don't, you change the, the value of the norm. However, k has the useful property that it's the average of k minus one and k plus one. And that property translates into a, a sort of weaker version of isometry for, for the shift operator. Uh, it's this property here. So this is, this is true of the shift operator and an operator with this property is called the two isometry. Uh, a second property that the shift has is that if you look at the um, image of the shift operator to the power n, it's at the intersection of all those spaces, what you get is zero. And, and the reason is very simple. It's because if you're in t to the n of h, T to the n of the Dirichlet space, that means that you are of the form z to the n times some function. So you have a zero of order at least n. And if you have a zero of order at least n for every n, then you have a zero of infinite order at the origin. And then that can only happen if you're the zero function. So that's a, using the identity principle for analytic functions. And for that reason, operators with this property are sometimes called analytic operators. And well, the final property is that the image of the shift operator is of co-dimension one. And that's easy to see it because uh, you're in the image of the shift, if and only if you're of the form z times something, which is equivalent to saying that you're a function that vanishes at the origin. So it's co-dimension one. Um, perhaps a little bit less obvious, but nonetheless true, is that if you replace the Dirichlet space by any one of these d mu spaces, the harmonic weights, then the same properties still hold. Okay, that uh, requires a little bit more work to prove, but it's still the case. And what's really nice is that there is a converse to this, that these three properties, in fact, characterize the, this pair mz d mu. And this is, uh, the theorem of Stefan Richter. So if T is an operator on a Hilbert space that satisfies the three properties at the top of the page, then there is a unique finite measure on the unit circle such that uh, the pair TH is unitarily equivalent to the shift operator acting on D mu. So these, these D mu spaces, even if you 
weren't interested in them at the beginning, they, they come up in a rather natural way here. Okay, so what is what use is this in trying to find shift invariant subspaces of the classical Dirichlet space? Well, here's the idea. Let's suppose that we're given such a shift invariant subspace. Well, just restricting the shift to this subspace gives you a new pair, a new operator, and a new Hilbert space acting on it. Uh, sorry, a new Hilbert space and a new operator acting on it. And it's it's immediately obvious that. Uh, properties one and two are satisfied as well. If you just go back to the, the previous page, um, when you restrict the shift to something, it's still going to satisfy this, this property. And it's sort of obvious that when you restrict an analytic operator, you still get an analytic operator. What's less obvious is that property three holds, but it still does. And this is a theorem that had been proved a little bit earlier by uh, Stefan Richter and Alan Shields. And so um, if you combine this with Richter's characterization of operators satisfying one, two, and three, you, you were led eventually to, to the following theorem. Actually, the theorem, I'm lying slightly because this is really two theorems rolled into one, but I've, I've um, put everything in one, one big statement. So. The second half is kind of Richter's theorem, and the first part is appeared in the paper of Richter and Sandberg. So it says that if F is a shift invariant subspace of the Dirichlet space, and we pick uh, any function phi in this um, space of dimension one, so this is the Richter Shields theorem, it says that this space will always have dimension one, uh, then first of all, phi turns out to be a multiplier for the Dirichlet space. And secondly, our uh, invariant subspace that we were trying to identify is of the form phi d mu, where mu is given by this rather specific measure on the, on the inner circle. So this is a really beautiful result. Um, and it's sort of moving towards a Berling type theorem, but it stops short of being an exact analog of, of Berling's theorem because, um, well, we don't know whether the operation of multiplication by phi acts as an isometry. So it's not clear whether this space here is going to be a closed uh, subspace of the, of the Dirichlet space. However, one thing we can certainly conclude from this result is that um, M is uh, a cyclic space. In other words, it's the closed invariant subspace generated by a single function. Why is that? Well, I mentioned on in the previous chapter that the polynomials are always dense in d mu. So m is the closed subspace spanned by phi, z phi, z squared phi, z cubed phi, and so on, which is just the invariant subspace generated by phi. So every invariant, closed invariant subspace of the, the shift is singly generated. And so it suggests that perhaps to to try and characterize these spaces, we should concentrate our attention on the following problem. Given a function in the Dirichlet space, what is the closed invariant subspace that it generates? And here is the problem. And so here are some uh, partial results. Before I, I state them, let me just say that in the case of the Hardy space, we know the answer. The recipe is you take your function f, you factorize it as a, an inner factor times the outer factor. And the closed invariant subspace generated by F is exactly the inner factor times H2. And we would like a, a theorem like that for the Dirichlet space. So here is a, a result along these lines due to Richter and Sandberg. So let's suppose that uh, F has an inner outer factorization of this form, FIFO. Well, then the invariant subspace generated by F is equal to both of these things. This takes uh, perhaps a few moments to, to drink in. Um, to try and understand the relation between this and the, the Hardy space analog, um, well, what's lacking here is that we haven't actually identified what the invariant subspace generated by F O is. But in the case of the Hardy space, uh, 
the invariant subspace generated by an outer function is the whole space. Um, and so what we would get here is fi times h2, and here also we get fi times h2. So we get back to the, we, the answer we know is true in the case of the Hardy space. And so what's lacking <coughs> by comparison with the Hardy space is the identification of this object here. What is, if I'm given an outer function, what is the invariant subspace that it generates? And I mean, in the case of the Hardy space, I already said that this is the whole space. And we might expect that this is also true in the case of the Dirichlet space. But in fact, it's not. And that's because there's another phenomenon that intervenes, uh, which didn't exist in the case of the Hardy space. And that's the, the, the phenomenon of boundary zeros. Remember that uh, when I discussed zero sets, I mentioned that uh, it's interesting also to try and identify which subsets of the unit circle can be zero sets for functions in the Dirichlet space. And now this is going to play a role. So to study this, I'll introduce a, a notation. So given a subset E of the unit circle, I'll write uh, D sub E to denote all the functions in the Dirichlet space that vanish quasi everywhere on E. Uh, we always put a QE because these, uh, this boundary function is determined up to sets of, of capacity zero. But the set E might be quite large in terms of capacity. It will be, uh, I mean, if E has positive measure, then DE will just be zero. But if E has zero Lebesgue measure, but positive capacity, then we can get something here that's genuinely interesting. And uh, Carlson proved that this set uh, DE is always closed in the Dirichlet space. This is not 100% obvious, but you can actually deduce it fairly easily using the weak type inequality for capacity that I mentioned uh, back in the first lecture. Uh, anyway, if you take for granted that DE is a closed subspace, it's obviously shift invariant because if I multiply H by Z, it's not going to make the zero set any smaller. And so this gives me another example of a closed shift invariant subspace. And uh, the existence of these new closed shift invariant subspaces complicates matters. Um, so here is uh, going back to our problem of trying to identify what the closed invariant subspace generated by a single function looks like. Well, here is here's a consequence. If we let E be the zero set of F on the boundary, well, then F is obviously contained in DE just by definition. And since DE is a closed shift invariant subspace and it contains F, it contains the closed shift invariant subspace generated by F. And so this is an added obstruction to uh, F being cyclic. Cyclic means that this invariant subspace generated by F is the whole of the Dirichlet space. And it's a reasonable question to ask, is that the only extra obstruction? So here is the, the problem. Uh, let's suppose F is an outer function, let E be its zero set. Then we certainly have this inclusion that I've just mentioned here. Do we actually have equality? And this is still an open problem. And it's an open problem even if uh, e is a set of capacity zero. In the case where E is capacity zero, DE is just the whole space because vanishing quasi everywhere um, on a set of capacity zero, I and mean, every function vanishes quasi everywhere on a set of capacity zero. So uh, in particular, we'd like to know whether if C of E is zero, do we have this equality? And this uh, special case is uh, actually a celebrated conjecture. It's a uh, conjecture of Brown and Shields. Uh, so I just want to finish this chapter by uh, saying a few words about this. So I'm just going to rephrase the conjecture, but it's just re restating what I've just said. So the terminology, as I, I just mentioned, if it's cyclic for the Dirichlet space, if the closed invariant subspace generated by F is the whole of, of D, that's another way of saying that multiples of F by polynomials are dense in D. And that's actually equivalent to saying that multiples of F by multiplier are the density. So that um, is the same definition of cyclicity that I gave yesterday. 
And two necessary conditions for cyclicity, F must be outer because if F is cyclic for the Dirichlet space, it's certainly cyclic for the Hardy space, since the Dirichlet space is, is dense in the Hardy space. And we know which functions are cyclic for the Hardy space, it's the outer functions. So F would jolly well better be outer. And this obstruction of using DE shows that E had better be a set of capacity zero. And these are two necessary conditions. Um, and the conjecture of Brown and Shields is that they're also sufficient. So uh, there are a few partial results. Uh, this is one due to Head and Mom and Shields. Uh, there's actually several difficulties in, in trying to prove the conjecture. One of them is to do with boundary values. And just to sort of try and simplify matters, uh, I'm going to look at just the case where my functions are not only in the disk algebra, but they extend continuously to the boundary. So they're in the disk algebra. And uh, what Head and Mom and Shields proved is that if we're in that situation, and if the zero set of F on the boundary is countable, then F is cyclic. What we would like here is not countable, but capacity zero. So there's quite a big difference between the two, but countable guarantees cyclic. And what's interesting about this result, uh, to my way of thinking at least, is that countable sets, well, they're sort of small because they're countable, but structurally they can be quite nasty. Um, and uh, this result works for every countable set, whether it has a nice structure or not. And then uh, another result that I proved with my old fellow and Karen Kelly, which gives certain examples of uncountable E. So again, we assume F is continuous up to the boundary, it's an outer function. Um, again, what we would like to assume is that E is of zero capacity. Instead, we assume a sort of measure theoretic condition so what's ET here? ET is the T neighborhood of F on unit circle. Mod of it is just the, the arc length. And we have these two conditions about um, the arc length of T neighborhoods of E. The first, uh, you should think of it as being a kind of regularity condition. Of e. It doesn't say anything about the size other than that E is measure zero, but it sort of says that E has a nice structure to it. And the second condition is very closely related to the capacity of E being zero. It implies capacity of E is zero. And in fact, for reg certain regular types of set, like Cantor type sets, it's actually equivalent to capacity zero. And then under these conditions, we get that F is cyclic. Okay, so just to finish with, here are a few further developments. Uh, I've talked about shift invariant subspaces in the classical Dirichlet space. In fact, the Richter theory, uh, Richter Sundberg theory, do, works equally well in D mu spaces for any harmonic weight. Um, and uh, for when your mu is um, a measure of a, a particular kind, when it's, for example, a finitely supported measure or supported on a countable set, then Sometimes you can sew a bit more. So there are results along these lines of Dominic Gio. And I think Omar is going to talk about uh, this kind of thing in, in his uh, plenary talk a bit later today. Um, yesterday, we heard Catherine Beneteau talk about optimal polynomial approximants. So the idea, original idea was that instead of considering all polynomial multiples of F and asking whether they're dense, the idea is to look at um, to restrict ourselves to polynomials of a fixed degree and try and approximate the function one as best you can. And this has led to all sorts of developments, which uh, she told us about yesterday. And lastly, well, you can talk about uh, Dirichlet spaces in several complex variables. Um, we, we learned a bit about this from uh, Nicolas' talk yesterday. And, I think there's going to be more about this in the colloquium talk with Sasha Volberg tomorrow. And in this paper, we looked at cyclicity on uh, weighted Dirichlet spaces with power weights on the bi-disc, uh, but we looked only at polynomials. So for, for in one variable, polynomials are relatively easy to deal with, but already in two variables, it becomes a, a rather more interesting problem. So that's what we, we dealt with there. Okay, so... Uh, I think on that note, I'm going to finish. I just want to 
finish up by saying one or two general things. Um, first of all, um, I think these slides, I'm going to send a copy of these slides to the Fields Institute and they'll, they'll put them up on the website. Um, there is a set of lecture notes that I've already sent several times, but I'll send one more time in case you haven't uh, received them before. And in fact, I've, I've modified them a little bit to take into account some corrections. So uh, this is the, the most up-to-date version. And finally, if uh, you're moved to, to try and see more detailed proofs, well, I just can't resist uh, making a shameless advertisement for our book where you can find details of pretty well all the results that I've talked about, at least those from before 19, uh, 2014 when the book was published. So it just remains for me to, to thank the organizers once again for the invitation to speak, to thank the Fields Institute for uh, hosting us, and to thank you all for uh, attending these talks. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Tom. We have a few minutes for question and remarks, if there is any. Well, seems not. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tom, again. Thank you. Wonderful series of talks. Uh, we have 